Thank you everybody so much for coming. We're so excited to see so many people here on a Friday afternoon. Um, this is the last event of our conference, Law School Matters, Reassessing Legal Education Post-Ferguson. It's been a great couple of days for us. Um, we're so happy to have all of these people here, uh, especially Kimberly Crenshaw, who has been a true trooper and has participated in all the events. This event was organized by Students for Inclusion. Uh, it's a new student group on campus for those of you who weren't at the other two events. Um, our goals are really just to kind of make sure that the school and its culture and kind of educational experience is reflective of the diversity of the student body. So for that, we just wanna make sure that we're all being proactive about ensuring that the spaces we create here are inclusive, both inside and outside of the classrooms. And this event was co-sponsored by La Alianza. APALSA, BALSA, MALSA, NLG, LAMBDA, ACS, and SUPERO. But we would also like to give big thank yous to our wonderful team in DOS, Tracy and Jeff, who definitely deserve an applause for making all of this happen. And the media services people have been amazing. All of the people that are here filming the events now, we couldn't have done any of it without them. Yes. Um, <laughs> We're now gonna pass the mic on to our keynote speakers. Hi, I'm Gary Peller. Um, I wanna congratulate the, the organizers of this event and the events this week um, and uh, uh, let you know how impressed I am at the self-determination of students here at Harvard Law School. I'm gonna describe a little bit in a few minutes my own experiences of not self-determination at Harvard Law School. And um, also tell you how honored I am to be here at this moment of, uh, which I consider an extremely important historical moment of disruption of business as usual at Harvard Law School in order to stop and take stock of issues that uh, perhaps have been neglected. So I wanna admit to you right at the beginning that uh, when I, when I uh, first, uh, my first image of what this event is was uh, of uh, committed uh, people committed to social change and ready to, uh, ready to kind of take on the power and that it would be a kind of insider discussion of strategy and stuff. And, um, uh, and so that was my original frame. And I've uh, since realized that that might not be really what, this might be a wider audience and this might, be, uh, 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 this might not be people who are already uh, committed to a particular path in response to recent events. So I have tried to broaden it, but please excuse me, I hope you find something useful in the particular way I framed it. And, and there are particular things that I would like to say to, uh, to students who are uh, willing to resist power about, about some of the things that, that, uh, that you might face. Okay, so the topic today is, uh, that I've been asked to talk about is uh, connecting Harvard Law School and Ferguson, I think it's connect the dots. And so I just want to start off with the connection, and then I want to work my way through why I think this, this statement makes sense. Uh, in, in my view, the fundamental connection between Harvard Law School and the events of Ferguson are that Harvard Law School, def well, I gotta back up for a second. At first I thought, well, I'm not really sure, and it was very useful, and, and I think an act of courage for Dean Minow and Dean Post of Harvard and Yale Law Schools to write an op-ed addressing the issue. Because for me, it really clarified what the problem is with mainstream legal education and the situation of racial justice in the United States today. So I want to go back to my thesis. The thesis is that Harvard Law School is one of those mainstream institutions of power in America that defends a universalist rule of law ideology as a way to comprehend racial justice in America. And I'm gonna to explain to you what I think is wrong with that, but that's the connection that I see. And defends it strongly and clearly. So the op-ed said that the problem in Ferguson was that the black community might lose faith in the rule of law. And the, uh, and, and the solutions proposed were procedural solutions, uh, some of which I agree with and I think are, demonstrate sensitivity, like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission might be a really good idea here. But my point is, I think that this, just funda this response fundamentally misunderstands what's at stake in, question <coughs> excuse me, in questions of racial justice. I'm gonna try to explain how, how um, uh, 
a progressive white administration of a, a school that's committed to being perceived as liberal can end up defending uh, the, the, uh, what I consider to be an indefensible, uh, an indefensible assertion of, uh, of the neutrality and objectivity possibilities of the rule of law in our current racial context. Uh, so that's what I want to talk about. Um, I want to present uh, two frames to, uh, to present what, uh, um, uh, uh, to help put in relief what I think the problems are and, 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 and why I'm making the assertion. Uh, but I also want to talk about one other issue that I think is connected up, and that's, that's, uh, uh, that's what I mentioned earlier. And that's the particular role that committed progressive law students at elite institutions have, the particular responsibilities of being a progressive person who wants to transform the system when you find yourself in the belly of the beast, and you find yourself in the elite, uh, in the elite institution. And I guess I could summarize my, uh, my thoughts on this by a little slogan I came up with. I hope you like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are not trying to integrate the ruling class. We are trying to abolish the ruling class. <laughs> Some of you like it. I'm glad about that. Uh, no, no, I wasn't. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so par part, of, part of the particular responsibilities of progressive people, particularly those from disempowered communities in elite institutions, is that I believe and would advocate that you, you, uh, you uh, uh, maintain what Du Bois called a double consciousness. You learn the discourse of the ruling class, the discourse of the powerful, the discourse of the elite. But at the same time, one of the dangers is that that discourse will come to kind of take, a, like an invasion of the body snatchers, kind of potify you. It will get inside. You will become using the, these standards as the standards by which to judge yourself, your own value, your own worth. You will become an elitist. Okay, and uh, and that's uh, uh, that's a uh, that's a real danger, and uh, the 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 not becoming an elitist means the ability to dissociate yourself from the grand rewards that are bestowed upon you by your admission to this elite institution. So I do want to say this at the outset: everybody who gets in here, regardless of what any law firm is telling you and everything, your ticket is punched. Okay, your ticket is punched. You have received some insularity from the, from the depri deprivations that otherwise could befall you. Your ticket is punched, but that carries uh, a lot of responsibilities with respect to those whose tickets have not been punched in American society. Um, okay, so th th those are the two, the two issues I want to address, and these are the frames. I think that racial justice has been understood in dominant uh, consciousness in America according to a paradigm that is impoverished. The paradigm I call integrationism, and I want to contrast it with a different paradigm called nationalism. I said earlier that, that one thing, it might be understandable that white liberals and progressives might understand race in a very impoverished way because the leading competing ideology of racial justice, black nationalism, has largely been articulated within the African American community by African American intellectuals way back to the 19th century. It's been a highly developed form of thought of social liberation, but largely, virtually exclusively, completely ignored as a possible way to understand racial justice by white liberals and progressives in coalition, perhaps, with, uh, with uh, elements of the black middle class who had an assimilationist, uh, assimilationist uh, commitments. Um, so this is integrationism, as I understand it. Integrationism understands racism as rooted in prejudice and stereotype. It's rooted in consciousness. It's rooted in thinking the wrong way about people, being biased. And this consciousness error, this bias, this departure from rationality, prejudice, uh, then achieves a social form when uh, people with some power use those ideas to discriminate against uh, against other people, and achieves a systematic form in the Jim Crow system of segregation in the American, uh, uh, in the, uh, American apartheid system until very recently. So I'm trying to describe, imagine a PowerPoint, okay, this is a postmodern situation, <laughs> I'm inviting you to. Um, 
there is a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, okay, so th this is a systematic, a systematic understanding of race. It, it locates the problem of racism in a particular point. It accounts for uh, the, the process of discrimination, and it tries to have a systemic uh, uh, account of it. And then it has a list of solutions that we're all familiar with. The solution to being biased is to not think about people in terms of race, to be colorblind. Or, well, it's at the least not to make any biased decisions uh, 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 about people based on race. To cleanse one's consciousness of this irrationality that threatens the purity of reason as we relate to one another. Uh, second level, to, to solve discrimination, equal treatment according to aracial neutral norms. And the third conclusion, the, the solution to segregation is integration. And integration had a very particular place to play in, the, in our story of racial justice because the full story was, connecting up this ideology, that if you integrated the public schools, the kids would learn that black people and white people are alike and they would all get along. And, and, uh, uh, and if, you think of, if you think racism is rooted in a miseducation, then this kind of education should have solved it. And that maybe is a little bit uh, of a window into the impoverished nature of this account of the uh, system of racial power in, uh, in America. Hard to see, though, because most of us, the very definition of rationality is tied onto this idea of racial power and what's wrong with racial power. So it's very hard to see, except from some other ideology about racial justice, what the limitations are of the integrationist model. I want to just summarize them before I introduce the other model. The limitations are that the integrationist model serves as an apology for all the standards of uh, admission in, in, in educational institutions or employment and job institutions, for all those standards that were developed during a period of apartheid and then continue to be used, yes, like the LSAT test, um, uh, continue to be used except now the, the uh, whites only signs have been taken down. That is, integrationism allowed American culture to claim an, a racial enlightenment without any critical examination of all the cu cultures of law schools, of colleges, of places of employment that had developed in a period of apartheid, a period that included the vast legal rationalization as legal, as consistent with the rule of law Seg Jim Crow segregation, and even slavery, of course. Um, okay, nationalism. Now, the, I'm getting this description of nationalism. Uh, uh, it, it might, it might uh, well, if it strikes you as ironic that I'm white, and uh, so I now am distancing myself from my uh, rudeness as a white person talking about the proper ideologies of race by attributing these ideologies to others. Stokely Carmichael, Malcolm X, the Black Panthers. So this is, where, this is what I've tried to piece together in my scholarship to form another way of understanding racial justice. Okay, so also a systemic uh, view of an alternative way to understand racial justice. Number one, racial justice does not exist in the mind and it's not a mental or consciousness error. Race, racial justice exists out there in the world. It's power that uh, racism consists of the maldistribution of power by race, not anything that people are carrying around in their heads. It's out there in the world. Thinking about people in terms of race is not a sign of prejudice or stereotype. It's a sign of the recognition of the particularity of communities and people in the United States so that the evocation of an African-American community is not a vestige of segregation that should be abolished once we once we uh, really achieve integration, the African American community, in the word, in the paraphrase, in the words of some of the these 60s and 70s writers, the African American community has a shared history, a shared spiritual complexion about the world. African Americans recognize each other in uh, uh, in institutions like this as connected in some fundamental. Uh, in some fundamental way by that shared history and by the project in the future that the community will continue to exist. The black nationalist position focuses on the question, what is the effect of this on the African American community? That's the key question in the current climate, not what is the effect on the rule of law. Second 
stage of the nationalist, uh, of the nationalist commitment, rather than understanding uh, um, the, the social form of racism as consisting of, uh, uh, of discrimination, which implies that there would be a neutral objective way to really distribute uh, 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 the goods of American society. Uh, nationalism understands uh, male distribution as subordination, as the subordination of one defined community to another. And then flowing from that, the systematic understanding is not segregation. The problem is not being apart. It's separation and the colonial administration of the subordinated community by the, I think the word superordinated community, uh, by the white community. It's a colonial relationship. And so this, this, this way to understand racial justice denies the possibility of a universalist neutral reason or rationality or, say in the Ferguson context, definition of reasonableness, taking the position that all such assertions of universality are illusions and fantasies of the Euro, the Euro culture that presented itself as universal as it colonized all the other peoples of the world. Put in that historical arc, actually, that I, uh, I find the argument so convincing, I'm going to sit down. <laughs> not really, not really. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so let's apply these now. To, I want to apply these models to the couple of questions that I said I want to talk specifically about. The particular role of, of students from disempowered communities and, uh, 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 and progressive students at an elite uh, law school. And I want to start this out saying that um, one of the things about getting admitted here is then you can turn and s question the, the, the standards of meritocracy that keep so many out without the accusation of sour grapes. So that's cool, and that's a form of power that I urge you to use. Um, uh, but those of us from disempowered communities all understand, I think, that our admission here, our achievement, is not really because we're so smart, but it is standing on the shoulders of our grandmothers and grandfathers and uncles and aunts and brothers and sisters, many of whom are not here or not in medical school or anywhere else. So I, when I got here, well, when I got here, I, let me just go into that for a second. I was completely freaked out and alienated. Okay, I thought, oh my God, they're going to figure out I'm a fraud. <laughs> And um, it, they did figure it out, but it took them, I, it was after I graduated. <laughs> uh, everything was cool. Um, but I, I imagine that many, many people can identify with what I'm talking about, that you know, they've made a mistake, okay? And then, you know, the, the, uh, we pull up to Peabody Terrace and we've got our old car loaded up with all our stuff and I'm all embarrassed. I think Peabody Terrace is where the preppies live. I was wrong. Y'all know Peabody Terrace is, is the preppies. Does the preppy mean anything to you? <laughs> and and um, uh, uh, so we get out, and we got a car all pulled up, and we open the door, and uh, my, my wife's mother had, had, had given us uh, jars of pickled zucchini, you know, homemade pickling jars, and when we opened the door, one of them rolled out and broke, and I was humiliated because I thought, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay, so, so the first day of class, the first day of class, uh, I'm very nervous, and, uh, you know, the class starts and somebody talks. And he talks with such authority and clarity. <laughs> I, I thought, well, first of all, they're all geniuses. I'm, f I'm screwed. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and I also hated him. And that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair. Okay? Um, but tied together with that diction that I heard, the very clear diction. I was happy to learn, and those of you have, you know, some of you first years I know, the diction doesn't necessarily match up with, uh, with smarts. That's really reassuring. Um, the, 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 uh, um, you can tell that, I hope you can tell that I'm trying to pass in the diction. I've learned, I think I've learned. But anyway, so, so, so then I'm around a little bit longer, and I start hearing some of my classmates Talk like this about the opinion of Justice Scalia really meant, like, and, 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 and I admit I'm, I'm a little bit alienated generally, but I'm thinking, 
who the fuck cares what you say about the like, who do you think you are? So what I'm talking about, I shouldn't use the F word, I feel bad now. <laughs> so what I'm talking about is the sense of entitlement and privilege that yes, we will be running the world and it really matters what we say, are you taking this down? I mean, that's what I really heard, <laughs> are you taking this down? And um, anyway, there were some other incidents. How many people know what jodhpurs are? Okay, so just there, bury that fact. I, maybe, I, now, this might be that I'm, uh, okay, jodhpurs, I think, I'm about to expose myself. I was just hoping you all knew. Uh, jodhpurs, I think, are the, the, the very uh, distinctive little pants you wear when you go horse poloing. Okay, now, I'm sure this doesn't happen anymore, but in my time, the, the self-consciousness of the ruling class was such, at such a low ebb that one of its members showed up in my torts class in his jod purse. <laughs> Duncan told me that wasn't that funny, but I, <laughs> all right. It pissed me off. I'm telling you, I've took it as an affront. And uh, um. Okay, but you're faced with a really, a really serious self-identity question. Should, do I, should I start talking like that? Is that what it is? And I will be them, and I will be powerful, and I will be an elite? Do I want to be entitled? Or will that be forgetting the people I went to high school with who are smart enough to be here, but they got in jail instead? Many of them to speak on behalf of, 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 of those who are cut out by the system of meritocracy. Okay, so, so integrationism, nationalism, meritocracy, law school, LSAT. The LSAT has a disproportionate racial impact. It is purported to predict well the performance of students in the first year. Institutions continue to use the LSAT as the main uh, selection criterion for legal education because it accurately measures uh, the, the performance in the first year, that seems to be a functional justification. It's not racist to use the LSAT. It, it has some functionality to the, uh, to the first year. And then you start thinking, well, you know, when the, they've been using it for years, so the first year, like when, before there were black people in law schools, the first year was just a white enterprise, right? And before they, Brown v. Board, the first year was, uh, a white enterprise that rationalized segregation is consistent with the rule of law. And this culture of the first year curriculum was, I think, developed in the 18, y'all got the pictures all over the place of these guys, that, that this is going way back. So what kind of consciousness could think that the way we teach the first year and performance in the first year could be any kind of baseline to measure meritocracy, to actually measure something besides the way we've been doing stuff? As, as Kim mentioned uh, uh, yesterday. Um, well, then you might say the reason we teach the first year the way we do is because it's got to match up with legal practice. That's what legal practice demands. That's what it takes for legal practice. You've got to do it this way. And then you might say, do you mean the same legal practice that was developed during a period of apartheid and that develop various customs and norms about how court should, uh, should operate and how legal arguments should proceed. And is that what you mean by the legal profession that's going to provide the baseline to tell you that your meritocracy is something different than hidden white supremacy ideology? Abolish the LSAT. Abolish it. Harvard's in a great position. Harvard doesn't have to worry. There's no excuse for this institution to use a racially biased test because there's no justification for it that I can see. But I might be wrong. I, I don't, I don't, uh, 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 I, I'm interested in hearing if there are other, uh, other perspectives on this. I might compare the LSAT very quickly. Do you want to be part of it and reproduce all its norms and cloak in the, in the authority of the privilege or is it false premises? I just gave a very quick analysis of the LSAT to suggest that these are false premises. And that in a transformed law school, in a transformed legal practice, it will, the ones who are successful and the ones who are not successful will be vastly different. And I hope you all transform that legal practice. 
Um, by the way, when you come into an institution like this and you're trying to figure it out and it all is like, when I first started, I really thought it was going to be like a Socratic thing where we all talk about justice in a very good faith way. Uh, but that was before I started the classes. And um, uh, so I had uh, a, a, quick, uh, a quick sense of frustration. Then I realized, okay, what I'm here for, and I was alienated, it was before, before the boycott movement, and it was, it was a very depoliticized time. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to learn and dissect the ideology of the ruling class. I want to know what they say this system that has, uh, that has been so unfair to my family and everybody I love, what they say this system is based on and what justifies it. And that is an unbelievably difficult project. And that project often depends on the, uh, on the presence in some of these elite institutions of those from the other class that we should recognize as necessary to help guide us into the confusing hallways and corridors of the mansion of apologia and justification. And so I just want to mention Duncan Kennedy as, in my mind, a great model of a class traitor who uh, should be understood uh, uh, to, to, to have done that noble thing. Um, okay, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter I, I want to assert is a similar critique of integrationism as applied to the Ferguson and recent police uh, misconduct, to sanitize it, uh, um, uh, incidents, uh, as the LSAT is for admission to law school. Okay, so the model of, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, this, uh, the, these competing ways to understand the situation, I want to just be very clear about, are presented for both African Americans, uh, progressives who, who want to address the situation, but also particularly for those in the white community. We identify, the white community is identified as what kind of white you are by how one responds in these situations of disruption and conflict and possible redefinition of how we might be together. Okay, so one way to see the Ferguson situation is it is a failure of the rule of law, and we need to vindicate the rule of law. In that model, it is possible, no matter who you send into communities, to police the communities, to just have them follow the rule of law. And you can have all various procedures to make sure they follow the rule of law, and the rule of law here is reason, it's rationality, it's being universal, it's, it's being colorblind. And that's a way to understand what happened in Ferguson. And that's, that's why the, uh, part of the reason I think that the, that the outrage has been so widespread, because that piece of it pulls in white liberals, civil libertarians, libertarians, and a whole mess of people who were worried about state power. It's a broad coalition that you get with that analysis. But there's another way to understand the situation, the nationalist way. The integrationist way is police are just police. They're just roles of police. It doesn't matter who the police are, what color they are, they are just going to apply these neutral rules of reason, and that's that because a neutral, universal rule of reason is possible. Well, the context of Ferguson, and generally in the United States, is a context that's closer to the colonialist analogy that was lodged in the 60s, probably than, that, than the analogy were then. <laughs> Grammar, please fix. Um, uh, the, um, in the following way, the, uh, the mass incarceration of so many members of the African American community looks like a colonial power coming in and dealing with the disruptive elements by imprisoning them. That's what the colonials used to do. The patrolling of black neighborhoods by scared white working class cops, and I want to point out that those cops are working class. They're sent by the powers to do the worst work of regulating and tamping down the bad elements of the African American community. They're sent in, 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 in squad cars and they're scared to death. That's the administration of this, colonial, this, this colonialized community by Outsiders, uh, uh, outsiders who were paid to go in and keep them down. And part of the context is the incredible impoverishment in terms of wealth and income of the African American community today. And part of the problem is the despiritualized malaise of the African 
American community today in a condition that I've described as sort of colonial, but with no real avenue of hope, no real way to get out. There's, it's not like Martin Luther King is promising a mountaintop right now. There doesn't seem to be a visible, um, uh, a visible mountaintop. So what should an elite law institution do, an elite law school do in this situation? Should it embrace a false universalist rule of law that says it doesn't matter who you send in that community as long as they put on the rationality helmet? Or, <laughs> that's not a good image. Um, uh, the, the, they're going to be able to uh, be fair and just to the community? Or do you examine the colonial relationship that exists between the administering white community and that African American community and call for it to be disrupted and transformed? To call, to, to not divorce the rule of law from the context of racial uh, uh, disparate power in which the police are patrolling, but to include the whole context. And when you include the whole context, the idea that the rule of law could be a solution is, I think, impoverished. So I'm returning to, to a thematic that I'm pulling again from the Panthers in the late 1960s. One way to understand Ferguson is the failure of the rule of law. Another way to understand Ferguson is the need for community control over institutions that administer in the community, such as the police. That's what, uh, that's what I believe. So two things I'm wanting to, ur to leave you with. I want to urge you, as progressive students in an elite law institution, to resist Keep your double consciousness. Learn the consciousness of the ruling class and how to do it, but resist. Don't you define yourself by it. And please don't adopt the, 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 the uh, are you writing this down, sense of entitlement and, and, and authority. Well, actually, deploy it strategically when necessary, but ultimately <laughs> resist it. Um, resist. But resistance personally is not enough because the stuff keeps on going. So you must disrupt and then transform. Resist, disrupt, and transform. And uh, um, on the second point, this, post -fer this Ferguson moment in terms of uh, ideologies of racial justice, I'm saying specifically to white progressives and liberals, uh, 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 please lose the kind of smug confidence you might have that your understanding of racial justice is right because you're being rational. And consider, respectfully please, the development, uh, the, the ideology of racial justice uh, that has been developed in the African American community. Thank you. I'm actually going to uh, just talk uh, for a few minutes. Whenever anyone tells you that, don't believe it, because it really means they probably won't talk for just a few minutes. But, but I'm going to try, um, partly because uh, Gary put so much on the table, and there's so much to discuss, both with you and, and with the folks here. So what I, I want to do is probably be a little backup singer, out, you know, adding a little riffs um, here and there. So um, just think about me as... Uh, the ooh, 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 and yeah, 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 to what <laughs> Gary said. Um, so I, I, I've been telling uh, the story in, in various uh, uh, moments about um, this as a site for the development of student activism uh, that eventually led to critical race theory. Um, this moment, uh, this conversation, um, invites a broader conversation about the relationship of uh, student activism and uh, contestations around uh, intellectual resources and access uh, to some of the events that are transpiring uh, in our communities and out there. So um, my point of departure on Ferguson to here um, invites, first of all, a conversation about how did we get here in the first place ideologically and politically, um, and what might we be able to learn from similar moments in the past um, when uh, there was a um, uh, civil rights framework that was de de uh, 
disintegrating and not giving us a lot of uh, doctrinal or institutional um, foundations from which to engage and struggle around some of the things that were happening. Um, in a moment like this where um, there are um, those who believe that a particular kind of accommodationist strategy uh, in addressing racial justice issues will likely uh, produce more outcomes than confrontation around some of the issues of racial justice. Um, at the same time, we're in a period where um, we are experiencing a more upward trajectory for some of us than ever before, um, and at the same time, uh, less uh, social mobility for the masses of us uh, than has been the case in recent history. Um, so, so we're looking at a time where there are uh, heightening contradictions happening within communities of color, and the question, or at least one of the questions is, what is the role, what is the relationship of elite institutions like these, and in, in particular, law institutions, to some of that which is going on? So I want to I want to start by identifying two broad frames. Um, they, in some ways, sort of overlap with Gary's frame um, about um, integrationism and nationalism. But I want to paint the frame in a way that causes us to think more about the baselines against which. Um, the contemporary distribution of power is thought about and against which efforts to intervene in that uh, distribution of power have been framed. Um, so imagine our um, uh, PowerPoint here. Um, and my PowerPoint would start with two quotes. One quote would be um, paraphrased as such. We come here uh, to the Capitol to demand, um, uh, to, to seek, uh, to cash a promissory note uh, that has been promised to us, a promissory note uh, that seeks to um, uh, give to us access to um, the goods, the opportunities, the life uh, in this society that has been promised to us. So that's, that's one kind of frame. And I want to call that a frame of repair, a frame that the contemporary distribution, um, not just of uh, the good life, but the contemporary uh, distributions of aspects of the bad life, being in communities uh, that are largely subject to militarized policing, being um, in groups that have no access to uh, the contemporary kinds of um, qualifications that allow you to uh, rise up and become a, a Harvard Law student. Um, both the the good and the bad distributions are not in that point of view simply there, but they're the product of a failure to repair. In other words, they are structured and created and not dismantled as is or was initially promised. So it is a context of distributional disrepair. Now, imagine another quote on the other side, which is, um, there are no debtor or creditor races in the United States. We are all just one race. We are one people, the American people, right? Now, do you know who said these two quotes? Do you know who said the quote about uh, we're coming to cash on a promissory note and when it was said? Shout it out, anyone who knows. Martin Luther King. Um, you might not recognize this particular um, phrase in his speech because you have been fed another one consistently over the course of probably most of your lifetimes. And what might that other little piece of his speech have been that you've heard over and over and over again? We're to be judged by what? Content of our character, not the color of our, our skin. So um, you, we wouldn't know that at the March on Washington there was a trenchant critique of the racialized distribution of the good and the bad in American life. You would think that the only thing Martin Luther King talked about at the March on Washington was the need to be colorblind. So colorblind that those maldistributive dimensions of society can't even be spoken about because to speak about it is to violate colorblindness. Right? So much of the way that Martin Luther King has been taken up in American culture has been to lift up that one piece of his speech that utterly utter undermines the other part of what his critique was. So, so that's one framework that causes us to look at the current distribution of good and bad around racial terms as problematic. Now, um, who said the other quote? 
not a creditor, not a debtor race. We're just Americans here. So it comes from Justice Scalia, right? Um, in Adirond, in which he's basically repudiating the idea that this social system in need of repair requires race conscious interventions to repair it. In other words, no one owes anything to anybody. What we have is just American society. It may be that the distributions of who gets to be at Harvard Law School, um, who gets to be part of the Fortune 500, who gets to live in neighborhoods where the police serve to protect them, right, rather than to surveil them, that's just a, a matter of choice, of merit, of good fortune, but it's not a product of a racial project that requires any ongoing contemporary efforts to intervene in it, right? So these are two prevailing frameworks, and I would say that what we have experienced over the last 20 years is the gradual substitution of the disrepair framework with the normalization, no one owes anything to anybody. Now, this no one owes anything to anybody frame has largely operated through the discourse around colorblindness, right? So colorblindness, um, not new as those of you who came last night know, um, originally articulated in Justice Harlan's dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson, held up as the mediating principle for the Equal Protection Clause, but as I discussed last night, it has nothing to do um, with the effort to dismantle racial injustice or white supremacy as everyone would have admitted in the 19th century. It's basically saying that we can be colorblind and not have to worry about losing white dominance in American society. That's what Justice Harlan said just before he said we need to be colorblind. So colorblindness is a framework around which contemporary maldistributions of race can be made to be constitutionally irrelevant. We decide we don't even talk about that. In fact, the first person who acknowledges the reality of these racial disparities is potentially the one who is racist because they're the ones who are looking at society through a racial lens. So the idea is we take the racial lens off, we just see people, we just see communities, we just see police, we don't see occupying forces, we don't see racial um, problems playing out in the interaction between police and communities. We don't see processes by which uses of meritocratic arguments justify institutions that are largely unrepresentative of the communities in which we are situated. So colorblindness um, serves as a denial to, a mechanism for not acknowledging, and importantly, a mechanism for insulating these current distributions. How so? Because if you take up the project of trying to fix, trying to address the disrepair, you're not only doing something that's not constitutionally required except for a few exceptional moments, you're actually engaging in discrimination, right? Your effort to repair is discrimination against someone else, right? So in, in case we have forgotten, it is the underlying argument in Fisher, right? Um, Cheryl Fisher isn't even arguing that I am equally qualified or if we had not had these particular programs, I surely would have gotten in. She's arguing that the very attentiveness to the racial construction of the University of Texas student body is discrimination against her. So we've moved away from the Equal Protection Clause doesn't require us to dismantle um, racial um, exclusion to the Equal Protection Clause prevents us from actually demanding it as a political project around which there's democratic support. Right? That's, a, that's a move that is significant right now. Our current racial structure largely being insulated through constitutional law against even institutional efforts supported by democratic processes to actually dismantle and repair these, these um, uh, institutions. Now, 
some part of this story is continuous with colorblindness, um, with formal equality. Some part of it is part of the story that we as students were engaging when we came here uh, with the assumption that opening up Harvard Law School to students also meant opening up Harvard Law School to the various projects out of which uh, communities that produce these students might have been interested in. So how do we think about expanding the civil rights movement, expanding the notion of what constitutes um, discrimination, expanding the tools that are necessary um, to actually seek a greater de degree of dismantling um, of the contemporary structures. That's what many of us coming um, into Harvard Law School ex experience and thought about. Um, there, there is this theory of rising expectations uh, when it encounters the, the no um, that leads to some, say, political movements. Well, we might say that the movement that students created here was a part of that, rising expectations, encountering institutional features that made those expectations almost impossible to be realized, thus creating the demands that the students articulated and the actions um, that led to the alternative course, boycott, um, and ultimately critical race theory. What I want to say now is that in many ways, the question about what the relationship is now to Ferguson raises very similar questions. And, and, and just to give you a little um, snapshot of it, because I don't have time to, to go much into it, um, one part of the racial justice movement that has been largely um, underappreciated for the radical critique it constituted um, was the movement for uh, inclusion of African American and other ethnic studies programs across the country, democratizing access to public education. Um, we know that there were these moments that happened like at Jackson State, um, San Francisco State, Cornell University. We know that it happened, but we don't think about that in the same way that we think about the struggle over voting rights, for example. We tend to think the real crux of the struggle happened in Selma. Um, it happened around the Voting Rights Act. It happened um, against Southern uh, racist sheriffs who were shutting down the democratic aspirations of African American people. We remember that as where it really all went down. And we celebrate the Voting Rights Act as perhaps the most radical intervention that came out of the Civil Rights Movement. And I want to underscore the fact that the Voting Rights Act was a radical intervention um, in, in, in one way that is particularly significant to the struggle over access to um, academic and intellectual uh, spaces. One of the aspects of, this, of the Voting Rights Act is that the presumption that an exclusionary uh, process itself is problematic until it can explain itself in race neutral terms. So the burden in the Voting Rights Act is actually placed on those states that historically discriminated against uh, people of color. Right? So when they want to change a voting procedure, um, when, when they want to decide they want to go from single member districts to at-large districts, they have to actually prove, um, or they used to have to prove, I'll get to that in a minute, um, they used to have to prove um, that it would not have the effect uh, of undermining the existing voting strength of African Americans. Um, even Section 2 um, of the Voting Rights Act actually asks whether communities of color have the ability to elect individuals of their choice, representatives of their choice. It wasn't about do they have access to white majorities so white majorities get to choose who their representatives are. It was a matter of placing the political power to make those decisions in the communities that are being represented. Now, I want to ask what access to higher education would have looked like if we had a Voting Rights Act model applied to access to intellectual spaces like these, right? Um, it would not be about 
who could be admitted based on the extent to which their profiles seemed to replicate or be preferred by those who had already been in these institutions. It wouldn't be about do they do the kind of things that we're interested in? Do they think about the kind of problems that we think are significant problems, right? Are they basically like us or like we've always been, but just they are coming from a, a different community, or they look different. What if we were able to imagine, and I can't say that I can I completely say this is what the Voting Rights Act would look like if it had applied to higher education, but I do know that one of the central questions that we would have to ask and answer is, are these folks who we are asking to participate in these institutions the people that the community would choose? Is there some democratic process for deciding that? So it's just a thought experiment to get us to think about what kinds of questions we would ask if we saw intellectual access as power in the same way we see electoral access as power. How would we think about these spaces differently? What kind of tools might we use to constitute them? So I identified that moment or those moments as moments of disruption, of moments of advocacy, of moments of uh, students and communities making demands on higher education. And, th and those um, contestations were actually every bit as hot, sometimes deadly, as the contestations around voting rights. What's the difference about it? Well, first of all, um, the hardness of the power of the South is contrasted to the more genteel power of exclusion in intellectual institutions. Bull Connor just doesn't seem the same as Derek Bach, right? We just don't see them um, in the same light. Although the presidents called out the police, called out the dogs, people were killed in these academic institutions. Fortunately, it never happened here at Harvard, but it did happen in institutions around the country. So um, what else helps us explain it? Um, the North never seemed to be the same kind of racial project as, as the South did. We just don't see it in the same light. So we could go on and, and look at the ways that these are artificially seen as distinct moments. What I want to encourage us to do is interrogate deeply the idea that the real struggle was out there, over there, down there, and not here, in here around goods and, and resources that are here. And by here, I mean um, academic institutions writ large. So um, let me offer just a couple of thoughts now, um, concluding so we can move to the conversation. Um, one part of what I think is so potentially exciting about the post-Ferguson moment is that I think it's a post-post-racial moment. In other words, we were stuck in a post-racial space, um, I'd say since the election of uh, President Barack Obama. Um, I would call post-racialism um, uh, a, a um, child of colorblindness, but one that's gotten bigger um, and more popular, um, in part because now it's a, a cross-political project, um, not simply one that tended to be part of the moderate conservative resistance to civil rights. So now having a popularly elected president uh, break through the glass ceiling, not by a confrontation with race, but through a pragmatic effort to navigate around it, right? So it's the idea that even a rose can grow through the concrete, right? Rather than why should there be concrete, right? <laughs> so if that rose can grow, so can you, right? So, so this sort of post-racial post, post pragmatism um, in some ways held us in, in, in sway uh, for some period of time. We all wanted to be, or many people wanted to be, like Barack Obama. He was able to figure out how to do it. Um, I think, I think that, that sort of fantasy um, obviously has deteriorated, some part of it being that he's trying to be president while black 
And that is as difficult to do as driving while black and shopping while black. So the idea that it's just another place to experience discrimination while black um, is a way of suggesting that just because he got there doesn't mean that discrimination um, is over. But I would say the other um, aspect of um, the deterioration of, of post-racialism is what happened in Ferguson. And some part of the post-racial frame is if you just act right, if you put your hands up, right, saying, I am not a threat, um, things will work out for the community as a whole. Um, so think about um, the uh, My Brother's Keeper as an example of a post-racial racial justice approach. It does not name racism as a problem. It does not call for institutional reform as an intervention. It does not look at the overall structure um, of race and its relationship between various communities. It does not recall um, the civil rights laws of the past that have been undermined uh, by the Supreme Court. It doesn't do any of that. It shucks and jives away from that. But what it does say is we have disparity the disparity that I talked about from Martin Luther King. But instead of saying we're here to cash a promissory note, the idea is instead is we're going to help you individual boys and men of color, women are not part of it, because then it would be more like a racial justice intervention if it was everybody. So we're focusing on that subgroup that reflects not just the greatest disparities, but the greatest threat. So now we've got a sweet spot, once again, this is post-racial pragmatism. So we've got a sweet spot. We can bring Bill O'Reilly in on this, because he's not going to oppose this in the way he opposes affirmative action. We can bring in all the civil rights leaders. We got Al Sharpton shaking hands with Bill O'Reilly. Go figure, right? Um, and we can bring in the moderates, who are all about um, trying to seek some savings from the budgetary stress of mass incarceration, which cannot be continued. So we've got this wonderful convergence of all these different political factions around this racial intervention that's not framed as a racial justice intervention. I will call it, it's post-racialism. Now, what's interesting about it is what happened in the aftermath of Mike Brown. So it doesn't talk about um, uh, race and policing, militarization, any of those institutional issues. Will it still work? Well, here's an interesting moment to suggest maybe not. One of the aspects of being part of My Brother's Keeper is that you as a city have to have a hearing at some point after you sign on. Um, communities around the country that are experiencing some of these problems with race and policing actually are my brother's keeper cities. Ferguson is one of them. So what do you think people talked about when they had their my brother's keeper hearing in Ferguson? You think they talked about Mike Brown? You think they talked about militarization of the police? You think they talked about the, the use of criminal um, penalties to raise resources for Ferguson city government? You think they talked about racial profiling? They talked about none of those things. Those are all structural, institutional, historical aspects of the disrepair. What did they talk about? Deficits of black men and boys. The need to create mentors at an individual level. The need to inculcate the kind of values that are necessary so that these disparities will uh, eliminate, become eliminated by the actual objects of racial discrimination lifting up themselves. So it's lift up by the bootstraps kind of intervention, right? So some part of Ferguson's repudiation of that is suggesting that this post-racial frame may not survive this Ferguson moment. At least, we might hope so. So what might be some ways that we can learn some lessons um, and some tools from this moment that can help? Um, so I'm not going to give a full list, but I'll say this. Number one, um, understanding that race-conscious interventions are not inherently preferential. It's not preferential treatment to actually address the disrepair, to remove some of the obstacles um, that 
are part of an institutional process of exclusion. It's not preferential treatment. For you to call it preferential treatment is to assume that the baseline in a society of disrepair is itself fair, neutral, and justifiable. If you move away from that view, then efforts to intervene and reconstruct cannot be considered to be preferential treatment. So those of us who feel like, oh, gee, do I really want to admit? Do I want to think about affirmative action as having anything to do with my being here, there, anywhere? Your very concern about that is a reflection of the fact that you accept the existing baseline as legitimate rather than accepting the baseline of Martin Luther King. Um, second thing, um, there has long been a conflict um, between beneficiaries of affirmative action and some of our liberal allies. One might say that liberals and conservatives actually um, agree more uh, than they disagree on the question. So um, is affirmative action uh, potentially reverse discrimination? Well, many liberals say, well, it is problematic and it creates unfairnesses, but it's an unfairness that we have to sustain for a limited period of time so that we can at least get some people of color into these institutions, right? So they both agree in some ways that the intervention has some problems associated with it. They also sometimes agree that affirmative action-based strategies allow some people to win the race who might not ordinarily win, right? So they sometimes agree that's in inefficient. They'll just say that normatively that inefficiency is something that we can handle. Well, I want to suggest that there are ways of pushing back, um, and I want to I want to share something with you. In um, and and then I'll sit down. Um, we were involved in a lot of anti-affirmative action initiative, uh, fighting back against it in Michigan and California, and we found um, that um, just telling people that there were preferences built into uh, the pathways to institutions like these were not enough. They could get it, but they needed to actually visualize it. Telling people that the intergenerational transfer of wealth um, and privilege and access um, actually undermine beliefs in the equal opportunity race. People could hear the words, but they couldn't really get it. Um, so what we decided to do was to try to make a very simple, accessible tool that allowed people to see history really quickly, and in seeing it really quickly, get a sense that affirmative action and other race-based interventions um, are uh, consistent with rather than oppositional to um, uh, racial justice. So my question is, can we play it? Yeah. Okay. And then I'm not going to say anything else. So thank you very much. Thank you.